Um, ich fange jetzt mal mit dem letzten Block uh, von Okay, I'm going to start with the last block, Maxus Mann. So, it's going to be easier tasks now, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Czech MK development in general and what we've been working on internally, also the people that were involved in that process. And this morning we already saw that our team now is a lot bigger now. And of course, that is also something that you can see in the vet developing team as well. So as of right now, we are nine developers. So we are working in this area. So one of us does it sort of on the side as a consultant. And we have some colleagues who are working full time on different components. And um, we are also in a position that we can say, OK, um, by the summer, we are going to have two more new developers that we are going to employ. So we're going to have to really think about how we're going to use them. And we're very happy with how we found these people. We're very happy with our team. And we really have a great mix in terms of their abilities and yeah, now it's really about just using our resources wisely. So another thing that we just started last year as well, that is something that we've heard about, Simon told us about the organization of his Czech team, also the development of the Czechs. And that is what we are doing as the Czech MK team. So the team is mainly work, working themselves. So that means that at this point in time, when I am the head of development. I can think about, okay, how can we really structure the development of CheckMK and structure it in a way that it's just a little bit better so we can really reply to all the requests and also improve the quality at the same time. And then I was thinking, okay, maybe in the Czech area, the hardware software inventory, we have a lot of requests coming in and some of them are very, very specific. They're very small. They're very, like I said, specific. And you might not really look at the whole picture at first and you just have to know how checks are built right now. And that's really what's very important in this area. And because of that, the team can really work autonomously and we can organize ourselves as well. And this team, unless of, I mean, I don't really work with them all that closely. They can really work by themselves a lot. And that's really, really great. And I would say that's very, very successful. And all the other things, so the overall Czech MK and how that is going to be developing, that is still going to be something that is going through my desk. And there are a lot of things that are generally um, concerning Czech MK general concepts, for example. And then Matthias and I, we have meetings on a regular basis. So sort of like architect meetings where we just talk through general um, situations, general ideas, and of course, then we can talk about it with the clients as well. So now an illustration of what exactly happens, how a feature is developed generally. And people who've done this before with us, they know that Check MK is almost exclusively driven by customers, so based on requests. And let's just have a look what it might look like. So it's going to start with a request. So a customer wants that uh, check him key is extended for a big feature, just a small detail. It really doesn't matter. They're all going through the same process. And usually what happens, it starts with an email, an email that's sent to the ticket address. So you open a ticket with us and then it goes from the general queue to either the check team. So mainly to Simon, he is then organizing it. And then it could also come to me. And then I'm just going to see, okay, how does it fit into our current development process? Is there maybe a job that's similar to that? Could we maybe combine those two? Or are we going to start a new development for that? And then we are starting a phase where we are designing, so designing the concept. So first of all, I'm trying to understand what the customer wants us to do in detail and very often in addition to just hearing about the problem that needs to be solved within CheckMK, we already have a suggested solution and then you sort of have to divide that and understand, okay, what is going to be the core that is needed and then 
very often what happens, Matthias, and I have a meeting and we just talk about, okay, how can that be implemented in check -in case so that it's really helpful for most people or a lot of different clients. So we always try to develop it in a way so that most of you can benefit from it afterwards. And then after that, it's also about costs, of course, and also scheduling. That's a very important point, and that also happens right with the developers, the developers that are then going to implement the feature later on, and they're going to be asked, okay, what's your schedule like right now? What's your time horizon? How much time do you think you're going to have to invest here? And then we have a dialogue about exactly that. So we can say, okay, I thought it was going to take less, and then somebody else might think it's more, and then we just try to just find a reasonable time frame and then that goes back to the customer during that design phase we also think about it with the customer for example if there are certain questions that are still unanswered if we need more information if the co the concept works for the customer and so on and then we get the go so the customer is telling us okay let's get started and then we have the schedule and then the responsibility for this whole development then moves from me to the developer so it's really the developer's task Q, if you want to call it that, and that is then driven by the developer. So it's not that I'm asking them every day, okay, when is it going to be finished? No, it's really the developer's task, and it's really the developer's task to really manage their tasks as well, and then letting me or the customer know and communicate with them maybe if there are difficulties or anything like that. And at that point in time, when we are in the implementation phase, so if it's with the developer, then it's being implemented maybe with first test versions internally or also sent to the customer and um, if they have to test it with live systems for example then there's going to be a review that's also new that is something that we've also introduced over the course of the last year and we are going to see some screenshots about that as well so what it could look like and overall what it really is is that we really pay attention to more we pay attention to the code others other colleagues are going to look at the code and they can judge the code as well. And it's not necessarily about the functionality as well. Of course, the developer is in charge of that and they know. They know that what they're building does work. But it's really mainly about the code understanding, the quality itself, and also the constructs that are being used and things like that. Of course, we're then doing tests from the developers are doing that. Automated tests can be built and the customer is testing it as well. They're testing when they get the first test version, of course. They're testing the feature. And then the whole thing is then going to the commit. So it's going to the daily bits and then also the releases. And another thing that we are doing very intensely as well in comparison to the previous years are um, so we have a big cycle right now, I think a year and a half as of right now. And a lot of people want to have something new and maybe they want to use it in that 128 or maybe we're building new features for the 15 and maybe people already want to use it in the 14. And what we're trying to do, we're trying to really build MKPs if that's possible. If that's possible, then we're going to build p patches. And um, we have some ideas about that as well, how that could be made even more convenient. So that's what's happening right now. That's what's happening with a feature right now. Okay, then the whole topic of bugs and other issues. So what we have here, this is a discussion point that we have all over again. So especially for people that just get to know Check MK, very often they're wondering, okay, well, I heard that if I report a bug on a ticket, then sometimes I'm going to have to give you the sources, so I'm going to have to pay for it. And yes, sometimes that is correct. In the end, what you can understand here is that you pay for prioritizing. So if you find a bug in your software and you want it to be resolved as quickly as possible, if it's really bad bug and you cannot continue your project, but you want to go live next week, for example, you're going to be happy to have this path. If you can pay us for us doing it right away, the alternative would be that you're going to send a feedback mail and we're going to then work it to the next stable version. That's our commitment. So the bugs that we are getting in via feedback, that's a mail you're going to have to send in. We are then going to have a look in comparison to the stable version. We're going to do our best to really resolve these problems. And usually that happens once a year and possibly maybe too slow for you. And then you have the way via the tickets.
In the Czech team, that is also something that stands out. Our colleagues are working on it very, very much right now. So internally, we have a backlog of two months, and they are now going to stick to that in the future. So they're going to try to, every few weeks, to really have a feedback day. They're going to sit down together and really work through the feedback mails um, that were sent in for checks. And then if they have the, reached the time horizon of two months, they're going to do a cut, and then they're going to continue next time. And we're on a very good path right now, so we're going to have to do the same also for other feedback mails. Um, unfortunately, we're not at that point right now because, like I said, it's a little bit more difficult because the problems are more complex and we have more complex software components, but we're working on it. Okay, then the topic of quality. Quality is going to be a next big point. We already talked about that briefly. So our review system... So we're using the tool Garrett, and that is a tool that's uh, a Google tool. And in terms of the GUI, it's a little bit dusty if you look at it at first. But if you look at it in terms of flexibility and usability, it's very, very good. So even if you really want to work quickly with systems, they really have shortcuts, um, so, so many, so you can work very, very quickly with them. And for some of you, reviews are not a nice thing anyways. And this way you can just work with it very efficiently and quickly. So the whole thing I would just like to show you very quickly. So what's happening right now, we only have the review as an option right now. So the developer decides, okay, I would like to have a review for my changes and then sends us commit before it's published to the review system. And then he then sets up a change and then he informs the person that he requests a review from. It could be me, for example, and Andreas then said, okay, look at those changes, what do you think? And then I'm going to have a look at the changes in detail and I'm trying to understand what he was doing. And then I'm giving my feedback and at the same time we have a tool that we're using right now as well as uh, Jenkins, it's a continuous integration tool and that automates all these different tests as well. So that also gives us some feedback in regards to um, what whether there are coding guidelines that were kept and so on. And it also does certain tests. And then we're in a situation where as a developer, sometimes you have to put your pants down, you have to say, okay, I built it, here's the code, now take it apart. And sometimes that can be very uncomfortable if you're criticized for this great code that you built. Um, and of course, it's very fancy and uh, super constructive, but sometimes in the end, uh, I mean, it's no good if the next person that has to work with it doesn't understand it because it's too complicated. And those are things that we're trying to avoid by doing that, just to make sure that we have, yeah, programs that we develop together. Okay, so now to me as a, as a reviewer, this is what I see. So you can see what I see. I see it uh, line based. So I see what changed and I also see within the lines, okay, this is what was deleted. This was what added and so on. So it's very, very convenient and it's almost fun working with it, to be honest. And yeah, it's a very helpful tool. Those of you that, who do software development on a bigger scale, I can highly recommend that. Okay, talking about Jenkins again, so just a short overview, of course, it's not always green like that, but it's getting better and we have different tests that we're running. We have Bandit up here, and that's an open source tool that you can download as well, and it's a type of security scanning. So it's looking, it does a static code analysis and it looks or checks if there are different language constructs like eval or something like that, something that could be difficult. And it also tells you, okay, look at this code in detail. Is that really secure? Are all the parameters validated and so on? And then we have a GUI crawler that can also be very helpful. That's a site that we're using where a crawler is running through the whole uh, GUI, all the URLs that it can access, it opens them and then checks if there are any stack traces or anything like that in the GUIs, any HTML problems, anything like that. So we're trying to cover that. Of course, it's sometimes possible that because of some refactoring or because of something there, 
might be a problem, some errors and some pages that aren't open very often, and you can find it with that. Then we also have the integration tests. So again, this is a site that um, is automated as well, and there are different tests that are carried out. PyLint is also a static code analysis, and again, it tries to find best practices or really problems with best best practices, to be honest. So some language constructs that you're not supposed to use and so on. And if we have Python, for example, that's very, very important to use. We've learned that because in comparison to other ones that are compiled, it gives you some added benefit. Those are things that are usually uh, found by a C compiler, some errors, subtle uh, programming errors that only pop up under special circumstances. And this is really what PyLint finds. Okay, other than that, what we're trying to do is we're trying to also make our software simpler in other areas, even though we are adding new components all the time. We're trying to reduce complexity, and we have done that right here. Sven is going to talk to you about that in more detail later, what we did exactly. And I just want to tell you right now that we have our own Python with our own, well, we have our own Python with 1.4, because as developers, we can really make sure that we only are programming for one Python version, and then we really have all different constructs from that end in the past when we also had old uh, distributions in version 5, for example, with Python 2, 3, 4, something like that. I'm not sure which version was on there, but it was very, very old. And now we really have the opportunity to be more modern and use more modern constructs. And right now we have Python 2, 7, 12, and that's the most current one that's available. And then we also have a very important point. We also have more dependencies that we're delivering ourselves so that we don't have so many dependencies to external modules from the operating system. So for 1.4, right now we also introduced that mod FCGID is there for all distributions and also Python modules. We are delivering them as well so that, again, we can just say as a developer, okay, I know exactly what kind of version I have and I know exactly what works and what doesn't work. Other than that, those are just general things really that are just there. So if I have a shared code, for example, I try to make it as generic as possible. And I always try to make sure that the code that is just growing and growing over time because there's new features that are added. Sometimes those codes are just too long. And then over time, you would just say, OK, what can I do in terms of language and doing it easier, restructuring it and just making sure that it works easier. And then um, another important point for us is also the automated tests and extending those. So this is really also uh, having a type of regression text, an interface test where you can just say, OK, we're just going to make sure that all this works properly. We're not where we want to be by far, but we are definitely on our way. And that's a topic that we are working on right now step by step. Another one uh, that's important is versioning scheme. There are some news here as well. So some of you might wonder why we had this job from 128 to 14. And we did some uh, changes here, one of them being that we removed um, odd to even steps between innovation and better face. And that is something that we had in the past because we adapted that from Linux kernel, and we sort of felt like one is unstable, one stable. And of course, being a hacker, a Linux nerd, you do know that. Um, if you're just an average user, you probably don't know that. Then you're wondering, OK, why is 127 not stable? And well, you just have to really read about that, and then you know and then it's very clear. However, it's not something that's very intuitive, and we want to really achieve that by saying, OK, check MK14 is going to be the 1.4, and it's going to stay the 1.4, and the next version is then going to be 1.5. And again, that is going to start with 1.5, 1.I1, and then going to be stable at one point. 
And then the next step is going to be why should we be scared to have a second level increment where we were always at there with one two two, one two eight, one and so on. And we were just thinking, okay, what does the one two do there? And we could just take it a step and then say, okay, we could um increment it in the front. So right now what we said, okay, it's the second number. And I would just like to say that this third number in our current scheme as we thought of is not necessary anymore but we have to keep it there just because of comp compatibility reasons because um, some just need three digits. So now we have the one, four, zero, and the zero in the third spot. It's just going to stay there for now. And like I said, the next version after one, four is going to be one, five. Okay, now we have another thing that is maybe hopefully something you can read in the back as well. So this is our current documentation. That's what we extracted. So this is our release cycle and Matthias drew a very nice picture for that as well. So I think the illustration is actually very good because this is our uh, release structure over the course of a year or a release cycle really. So you start with one version and then you have uh, daily bits for a while. We're destroying the software. We're then uh, recreating it and so on. And at one point in time, we're going to say, okay, there's a point where we we are going to have an innovation um, one. Lots of clients want to taste test the features and then we're going to have all these different innovation versions and then you, we can also have patch releases if there are some big errors in there and that just continues until we're at a point where we're going to say okay this is the better phase we are there for one four right now and we are then going to split from the master branch um, and we have the one four zero branch and then we're going to continue down here so the blue branch right here we have daily builds for the one four zero and then that's where the circle closes us again and that's where we're actually a master as well we're working on that and then maybe the software is just reworked again until we're at a point where we're going to say okay we're back at the innovation phase and that's where the circle closes another thing that we also want to introduce are the terms of active and pa passive maintenance so that's the idea that we really have, okay, we're going to set that in stone, what kind of duration of time we are going to support which version. So the active maintenance is really what you're used to. So as soon as, as long as we have patch releases, we're in active maintenance. So we build bug fixes, we're very proactive, new versions. And then after a while, and um, those times are determined, we're going to say, okay, now we can't do it anymore, it's too much work, or we just don't want to do it anymore, or whatever, because it, there's no benefit to it anymore. So we we abandon the maintenance and then we're going to have the next uh, version where we do have maintenance and there are people that if you still really need that version because if you freeze in your software version or whatever they can still get the passive maintenance so they can ask us to really maintain this version because they have it fixed so they need it and then the intervals are also not a very um, difficult at all I wouldn't say so for the daily builds we can't do patch releases so in this case we don't do maintenance right so for innovation, those versions, we have the innovation patch releases. So what we have here is a time frame of about one to two months where we do active maintenance. So if we have severe bugs, for example, malicious bugs, things like that. And you can also ask us to do the passive maintenance on top for one to two months. So it could be up to four months. And that's the latest point in time where you would then do the use the next uh, innovation relief. For the stable version, it's actually the same scheme. However, that it's the difference being that it's one and a half years. So that's what we do with our current cycle. And that is something where we said, okay, this is something that we stand behind. Three years is uh, the program if you do uh, both. So if you then pay for the um, fixing of the bugs and that shouldn't be too much. Okay, so the topic of supported distributions, those of you who know me, you know that the top point is clear. So we can just see, okay, what's in the enterprise, what's being used. And if there's somebody, for example, that would say, 
I have a very rare or privately used uh, Linux distribution, you would have to say, I'm sorry, we cannot afford to do that. We cannot do that uh, because nobody's paying us for that. And we have um, major distributions that need to be supported. And I think everybody that's here can actually agree to that, that this is just what makes sense. And in terms of the time frame, how long we are going to build builds for the different ones, again, we're going to look at the maintenance that the manufacturer of the distribution gives us. So um, ZOS 5, for example, that uh, was just told to us recently. We still have the builds for that. And now for us, we're wondering, OK, how much longer are we going to do that and really invest in that? So currently, we are not at a point where we would say, OK, we want to get away from it. So maybe just the question, who would need a CentOS 5 picture for the current Check MK version? OK, we're going to have to have a talk later. That's not a problem at all, but the old CheckMK version 128 or patch releases for that are still available for CentOS 5, and then the current version CheckMK 1.5 and so on. You can just say, okay, an old distribution like that, maybe you don't need the current CheckMK on that. Okay, and another point, again, I would like to ask you, um, where for most of the distribution, we still have 32-bit. Who needs that? Very good, because we're going to turn that off soon. So for 1.4, there's not going to be 32-bits anymore. For new distribution, we have not used it anymore. And for 1.4, we're not going to use it at all. And I don't think anybody's going to mind that because that was to be expected. Okay, are there any questions? Ah, eine Häufung. So now I understood that for version 1.4, you always use Python 2.7.12, is that correct? Yes, it is part of the distribution. Then how do you do the Python patching? Because Python itself will not be without bug fixes for one and a half years, so you have to patch it somehow, right? Yes, the Python is part of the CheckMK, and as soon as you do a uh, CheckMK patch release, we can also patch the Python. For you, that's transparent. You don't have to do anything. So it won't always stay 2.7.12. Just for this one version? Okay, what I would like to ask for would be an ARM build. What, what do you need it for? For a Raspberry, for example, for, for home, to play around with. I mean, it will also happen in, in uh, server centers as well. ARM servers are something that's, that's uh, coming. Yeah, I suppose it's difficult right now, especially the microco is something that we would have to work for. But the other components should be quite easy to implement. Uh, we have to look at the builds, though, because if you start with a new architecture, which distribution do you want to use in this architecture? Do you want to build all of them? Then suddenly you have the double amount of builds you want to create, so we have to see how to do it. My question is very similar. How many codes lines do you have in Python these days? Like, when do you go to Python 3? 2.7 will be supported till 2.0. 2020, so that's three years, and then Python will stop the support for 2.7. So within the next three years, the transition will have to be made. It's interesting also for those who write plugins because they would have to do the transition as well. Is there a roadmap yet? Well, you could say the first step has been made already in this direction because we are at a Python version. And if you want to write compatible code, that is the first step you have to do to get to, for example, 2.7, where you could write a compatible version if you want to. It's something that is still tricky. I mean, in theory, we could also say we have our 2.7 with us, and if there's problems with it, we can patch it. Yeah, but Python won't be doing any support for the Python interpreter. Yeah. But I'm not saying we have to do it like this, but... It is one way of looking at it. Yeah, I'm personally the one holding people back a little because Python 3 means a lot of work for us. And the 
customer profit or the customer profits in a way that the software uh, becomes slower and needs more uh, or eats up more performance and i'm pretty sure that if the official python support runs out somebody will do it hopefully not us who will have to keep it updated but yeah but i'm 